if you have Frederick Widowson's book, the book is A Bible Believer Looks at World History. We're continuing our intermediate discipleship. Now, uh, remember the Olmec culture, uh, O-L-M-E-C, the Olmec culture, they left a civilization and buildings that seemed very, very similar to the pyramids in Egypt. I told you about a theory which seemed very, very likely that the sons of God and the Nephilim and their descendants, when they were being annihilated, extinguished, and pushed away, they were trying to go at the furthest landmass near the ocean. So then uh, some of them, we've seen remaining stories and accounts at Great Britain during King Arthur's time. And then when that part became extinct, then we hear about South America. Now, a lot of their building structures were similar to Egypt. And remember, there were Phoenician coins found there. And if you recall, remember, Phoenician culture was where the Nephilim and Nimrod's religion and culture was dominant at that time, when Joshua and the Jews annihilated the giants and the remaining seed. So the Olmec culture, a lot of their building and design is similar to the sons of God that you would think about during the times of Genesis 6. But remember, the Olmec culture, it uh, died out, so then their buildings remain. But then there was a group of people who pretty much carried on similarly what the Olmecs did and took over the buildings, and that's the Aztecs. And then I've described a little bit about the Aztec culture, their building, like they revived some of the sacrifices, and then some of the things that they learned in those buildings when they took over the Olmec civilization and some of their buildings and saw some of uh, the influence that they had on some of the buildings, they took and learned some of that and revived that satanic religion of Nimrod that the Olmec culture was practicing. And so the Aztec, they infamously carried on that religion and they revived that culture. But then, remember, I talked about the Europeans that through their colonization, the Catholics, now that they're conquering the new worlds, all these accounts and their stories and the practice is dying out. So that pagan culture is dying out. It's being replaced with a different culture. And that's a Catholic culture. That's why the dominant religion that you'll find out in South America is Catholicism. But you'll notice elements of paganism mixed in with that one too. All right. So now we're continuing on. The guy's name is Moctezuma Zocoyotl. Uh, uh, Zocoyotl. Okay, uh, Zocoyotl. His name means Moctezuma the Younger, whom we call Montezuma the Second. So I talked about his father. Now we're going to talk about the son. It was during his timeline that we see the civilization finally falling, the, the famous Aztec culture. Widowson says on page 225 that he ruled from 1502 to 1520, conquering much territory for the Aztecs to the southwest and the east of what is now called Mexico City. So that's where Montezuma II was reigning. It is now the place which is called Mexico City. His expeditions met with mixed success, and he left many enemies of the Triple Alliance unconquered. So remember, there's a powerful uh, kingdom that they were able to create, and that was the Triple Alliance. And it was a brainwashing, kind of like the communist Chinese, where they were overtly patriotic, nationalistic, and they were saying that our kingdom was always as powerful. Remember, they kind of got rid of their nomad beginnings. They didn't really inform their people of that. They just brainwashed the people. Yeah, we were always this powerful, rich, and great. He also created many enemies as his ancestors had done. These cities and tribes were looking for someone to unite them against what they viewed as a religio-political monster. So who were they waiting for? That someone came in the form of dreams that Montezuma had of floating temples in the Gulf of Mexico. So Montezuma, he 
allegedly had these dreams where he saw what he called floating temples. And the people were waiting for this antichrist, excuse me, for this deliverer to rescue them from this dictator. Kind of like today, right? See, you just learn from history. Everything's repeating. And that's how you can automatically change all of civilization and culture. How you transform it is you get someone that you hate. And then you're looking for a Messiah figure. All right. And that Messiah figure was obviously Catholic. And we know that the Antichrist is going to be Catholic. The fleet of Hernando Cortez. All right. That's the next famous explorer. He's the one who conquered the Aztecs. So Hernando Cortez, he came in with a fleet of ships. And as he landed on their shores, Widow Sin says that Cortez was supposedly under the command of Diego de Velasquez, but against the commander's orders, he led an expedition of 600 men, 17 horses, and 10 cannon from Hispaniola. In August of 1519, he burned his ships to prevent desertion of his men after landing at what is now Veracruz and subjugating the Mexican Indian Kingdom of Tabasco. Yeah, Tabasco sauce. Yeah, that's the name of it. But it is, uh, so this man, you can see how much of a, I don't know if you would call him a little strange, weird, or madman, or demonic, but there was no doubt he was very clever, is that he burned down his ship so that, why? His men don't desert him, so that he can take control. Cortez is listed as one of the great generals throughout history, actually. So uh, if you study the mind of Cortez, his war tactics, that's the reason why he was able to win. He also opened negotiations with Montezuma. The next month, he invaded central Mexico. The Totonac, uh, the Totonac tribe allied with him against the Triple Alliance, as, as did the Tlaxcala, so there were two tribes that joined him. Why? Because they hated the Triple Alliance, remember. They were waiting for that Messiah figure to conquer. In spite of this, Montezuma let the Spanish into Tenochtitlan, modern-day Mexico City, as friends on November 8, 1519. So Montezuma, I don't know why, he would still let the Spaniards in and then try to open negotiations with them. I don't know why, but let's keep reading on. Obviously, you know what happened. There has to be a fight between them. The Spaniards, they want to take over the uh, civilization and steal their uh, wealth. In December, Cortez took Montezuma prisoner. Well, that's no surprise. All right, so Montezuma now became prisoner to Cortez. Velasquez sent a force of 1,500 men to defeat Cortez and punish him for disobedience. Because remember, Cortez was under the authority of Velasquez. But then Cortez did his own thing, all right? So it's like Sean Lawler taking a couple of my men and then doing something behind my back, all right? Okay. So then, yeah, God forbid, yeah. <laughs> clever general, all right? Watch out for this guy, all right? He came up with that uh, clever title. Watch out for this guy. <laughs> Anyways, I jest, but... Uh, wait till I hit Tom Cho later tonight, all right? I am going to address him. My wife knows what I'm talking about. So. But anyway, the conqueror of Mexico left his captured city and marched to the coast with his soldiers and Indian allies and defeated his fellow Spaniards, enlisting the vanquished into his own army. So Cortes, he had the allies, of uh, what uh, they were dubbed as Indian allies, and then he was able to conquer Velasquez and his fellow people. Then he took the conquered and then combined them with his own army. So he was growing in power. So Cortez was growing. When they returned to Tenochtitlan, they found that the commander he had left behind, named Alvarado, had been so harsh that the Aztecs had revolted. So Cortez, he lost his control over the Aztecs now. He conquered Velasquez. And then when he returned, the person he left in charge of, Alvarado, he was so uh, cruel to the Aztecs that the Aztecs revolted. So now Cortes has to fight again and to dominate the Aztecs again. And this time it wasn't as easy because Montezuma was on, uh, Montezuma's people were on guard. 
Montezuma was murdered in the fighting that resulted. So in this re revolt, Montezuma died. After suffering several defeats and having his force nearly annihilated in his attempt to retake the capital of the Triple Alliance, the Aztec Empire, all looked lost for the conquistador or conqueror. So Cortes looked like he was going to lose now. But what happened? As he built a small fleet to retake the city, protected by water, his fortune, so remember the Triple Alliance and their city, they built it in a terrain where it was protected by water, if you remember their nomadic beginnings. Okay, let's keep reading here. Uh, as he built a small fleet to retake the city protected by water, his fortunes turned. Why? When Montezuma's successor and a great many of his soldiers were killed by what? Smallpox. Now, if you recall what happened uh, to this other tribe within the South American region, the Inca Empire, remember there was an epidemic that spread out that was brought in by the Europeans, smallpox. Yeah, so those white people messed everything up. Okay. As he built... <laughs> All right, yeah, amen. All right, continuing on, continuing on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, they were killed by smallpox brought by the Spanish who had some immunity to it. So that's why the Spaniards, because they were immune, now they had the upper hand now. So what's going to happen now? Cortes then laid siege to the city for approximately two months and the European soldiers, many now equipped only with bows, arrows, and javelins like their many thousands of Indian allies. So now they're going primitive warfare. Many of... Uh, Many, uh, excuse me, many of which joined them after the smallpox epidemic was seen as the judgment of the gods. So they thought that this is the gods judging the Triple Alliance. So let's join in Cortez. And I'm sure those uh, diehard Catholics thought the same way too. Fought their way to the center of the city in an epic battle. It is estimated more, that more than 100,000 people died in this battle and the epidemic. Cortes is one of the most highly regarded generals of his era for this brilliant siege. The destruction of the Aztec Empire that lasted for 152 years was no cakewalk, but a true contest in arms rivaling the greatest battles of the old world. The Spanish also used their literary skills to justify their conquest of the Aztecs and other people in religious and political tones with the kind of justification that all conquerors have used to explain cruelty and destruction. So we see a superiority of language that, they, that the uh, conquerors use to, against their conquered. And that's nothing new. You've seen that throughout history with the Greek language becoming the universal language thanks to Alexander the Great. And then through the Roman Empire, they argued for Latin. And then that's where we're at, the Roman Catholic Church arguing the Latin language as the religious, uh, as the religious language of the church. So then the Spaniards did that with their language against the Aztecs. So thus, the mighty Aztec Empire, where you hear all this crazy Nephilim culture civilization, died out. It was now replaced by Catholic. And you can see now the devil switching now. He's switching toward a Catholic empire. And what's going on right now, it's becoming a communist Catholic setup. That's what the devil's waiting for. But guess what? Like what the devil did with all empires, he's going to betray the Catholic empire, and they're going to fade away. Why? It's going to be purely of Satan this time. It's going to be a satanic empire. So what Satan does is, if you look at his image of, Nebuchadnezzar, of Daniel chapter 2, all those kingdoms are the devils. Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome... And then the human culture mixed with the iron culture. What does Satan do? He just moves along. He lets one empire take over and then swallow up the other. And then he moves on to the next empire. Until he hits what? His 666 empire. That's what's going to happen in the end times. So what Satan was doing is that he don't need the Aztec empire. You might say, why? Because the Olmec is the closest where you can get to the Nephilim culture. Aztecs. They're just, uh, they're just humans reviving the culture. 
There's nothing supernatural, nothing Nephilim, to my knowledge, during the Aztec Empire. The Aztecs are trying to revive it, though. Uh, you've heard about the Inca Empire. They were pretty close to it. They had these uh, witches that would speak for dead emperors, and it was a weird, crazy thing, right? So all of it was just being carried on through witchcraft. But then, like, literal, physical on the earth, where the sons of God and the uh, devils of hell, they were not, like, present on the earth, nor their descendants. They were working spiritually. So then Satan, now he's switching to... That's why you can tell his activity and his hand on his... Nephilim culture during that time was fading out. He's moving it toward Catholic. Why? Because a couple centuries he's already mingled the church with Roman paganism. And he's seen the success of his Roman Empire, the Catholic Empire. That's why Satan's switching to that. That's why Satan's switching to that. That's why during the Arthurian legend timeline, the Nephilim culture... Some remnants of it could have been carried on that time. Why? Because Satan's trying to judge who's going to stand, whether this empire that he's carrying on the remaining Nephilim culture or the Roman Empire. Well, you know what won? The Roman Empire. So Satan, that's why he's switching to there. So you learn a lot from history. A lot of people online, they ask me, you know, what's the point of learning all this kind of stuff? You know, why don't you get into the Bible? My friend, you're already learning something biblical. I might not be giving Bible verses, but this is biblical. You got to understand that history is so important. Why? Because the Bible is a history book. And history is so important to learn because you need to understand human nature. You need to understand how the devil moves. Not only that, you're living in that time right now. So in order to understand the nature of mankind today right now, you learn from history. You learn from history. History is incredibly eye-opening. You got to understand that even the great Dr. Upman, while he's so intelligent and covered all these subjects, before he even taught all these subjects, you know what his first PhD paper was? It was church history. Because he had a historical perspective, he was able to predict things and then study all the necessary subjects that were important for a Bible believer to be armed with. So that's why it's important to study your history, all right, before you get all critical. Now let's go to page uh, 274 on Whittleson's book. So we've now seen the fall of the pagan Aztec Empire. We're coming to a different timeline. Whittleson introduces this subject very well. Now there's a Greek manuscript, remember, that I kind of indicated. Textus Receptus. This is extremely important for you Bible believers to know because this is your manuscript evidence for your King James Bible. It's Textus Receptus. You might say, what is Textus Receptus? Uh, the New Testament, obviously it was originally written in Greek. And then so we have to have manuscript evidence. Our Greek manuscript evidence is Textus Receptus. Textus receptus, it basically means the received text, received text. If you, uh, it's so amazing. Textus receptus, when you look at the manuscripts, later on today, they found way more Greek manuscripts that the KJV translators did not have. And then the critics and modern Bible translators claim, well, see, that's why our modern version translations are superior. No, it's stupid. The reason why it's stupid is because the Greek manuscripts that they dug up that the KJV translators didn't have, it actually turned out that 99% of the entire Greek manuscripts, including the new ones that they found, supported Textus Receptus. That's incredible. So that shows that this is your strongest manuscript evidence. There's no doubt King James Bible is the superior translation. So the King James Bible came from Textus Receptus Greek manuscripts. Recall the previous two manuscripts out of Textus Receptus. The two manuscripts, remember Syriac Peshitta. Remember I talked about that one? Syriac Peshitta was very important. That's why the Syrian church was extremely important for your church history. Remember that? That's where the Nestorian church came from. Uh, we see John Chrysostom. He was based off more from the Syrian church direction. All right? And remember, he was more of a literalist. Even though he had some Catholic tendencies, 
He was more Antiochian in mindset. And Antioch, Syria, is where the Word of God is based. So Syriac Peshitta, that's your evidence of early 2nd century manuscript evidence. And remember, the guys who were carried it on, I mean, Baptist history can go long back where you get Anabaptists and then the early Anabaptists based off of Waldensians and then the Waldensians, they were based off of Vaudois. Vaudois were 2nd century. And they were the ones carrying the scripture, which was Old Latin, remember that? And that is 2nd century again. This is 2nd century again. And I told you stories about these people that just put you to shame, remember that? These guys, you know what their track passing was? Their track passing was writing scripture verses that they memorized. I'm telling you, they memorized books, if not chapters, all right? So they, if not books, chapters, excuse me. So they memorized tons of verses from memory, and they would just write down the verses, leave that behind after they slept at a certain inn. So these people, they were incredible with the knowledge of the scriptures. I told you about the testimonies of these great Waldensians and Peter Walder that came out. Uh, during the time of John Wycliffe and John Huss. But then the, uh, the Catholic Empire, it was growing in power. They burned John Huss to the stake. They made sure Wycliffe's dead body was burned too so that there won't be a single soul left. They made sure that the uh, Waldensians, that they were all slaughtered. I mean, they slaughtered thousands. So because of that, you would think that not a Bible believer is remaining to keep up the, keep up the word of God. But guess what? The Lord used it through that original language that scholars talk about, the original Greek, right? He used Textus Receptus. Through what man? Widowsons introduces him very well here. He writes here, page 274, Who is the man whose writings still generate so much interest that one collector paid uh, $30,000 for a first edition of his work? which now resides in a bank vault, who taught Tyndale, influenced Martin Luther, and printed a Greek New Testament that was consulted by the King James Bible translators. His many admirers who circle the globe will pay huge sums for his writings. His detractors will spend a great deal of paper and ink denouncing him. To quote J.A. Froud in his work, Short Studies on Great Subjects, Quote, there had gathered about his name the hate which mean men feel for an enemy who has proven too strong for them, the vengeance which the monks could not inflict upon him in life, they proposed to wreak upon his bones. This man is Desiderius Erasmus. Desiderius Erasmus. Erasmus denounced Calvinism, actually. Now, I'm going to introduce Calvin, the, that hellish system later on. They were the ones that ruined, uh, they are the ones that ruined the Christian Bible-believing movement. All right? I don't care if you say Reformation is based off of Calvinism or not. I'm not going by Reformation. I'm going by a Bible-believing movement, the people who are closest to the Bible. Remember, I taught you that in early church history, when the church continued, that they had their doctrines wrong, but you got to understand this. They didn't have wealth of information like you did. And the Bible-believing knowledge that you have is an accumulation of 2,000 years. And guess what? Studying doctrines in that book does not end here. There's still a lot more to learn. So that's the reason why you see these people. you got to give them some grace during that time that they didn't know much doctrine. Why? Because they didn't have a free Bible on their hand. They had manuscripts. And they memorized the Word of God more than you did. All right? So you got to understand the doctrine that was important during that time was salvation, obviously. And secondly, that they weren't going by the wicked Catholic church system. So that was the importance of their doctrines that time that the Lord saw fit during that time period. And then I taught you at Revelation 2 and 3, God understands that they have doctrines messed up, but he won't give them a, a greater burden. Why? Because he understands that during that time it was overwhelming. If you recall that, that I taught you that. So I'm not going to repeat that again. So I don't go by Reformation movement. I go by a Bible-believing movement. If I credit the Reformation, it's because a part of it contributed to the Bible-believing movement. And then where the Reformation disagrees with the Bible-believing movement, guess what? I'm going to disagree with them. 
all right? Calvinists, they always, uh, I always kick hard on these Calvinists, and I'll continue to do so, all right, because they're, uh, it's so important because they're having a big level of significance right now today for championing Bible-believing truth. No, it's not Calvinism, so I'm going to kick them hard. Calvinists, they're going to boast, well, where are your preachers who were uh, anti-Calvinist or Arminianism? Uh, I can point out Spurgeon and Whitfield and these guys, Luther. That's where our Christian churches come from. Where does your come from? Ours goes back to early centuries. They never even taught Calvinism. Calvinism is a new religion. It's a new cult. They can't pull up during the early centuries. They can't do that. Why? Because the early centuries didn't even bother teaching Calvinism. But I'll tell you who taught Calvinism. Augustine. The bad church father. Yeah, that fruit, fruity guy. All right? I told you about. That Augustine was a bad apple. You want to wanna boast about your preachers, your doctrine based off of a corrupted fruit like Augustine? Who corrupted church history that I taught you before? Who was part of that Catholic system? No, thank you. All right? If that's where you want your doctrines from, be my guest. I ain't following that. And John Calvin, he, uh, what he was is that he continued Catholic practices. So I'm not going to boast about my Calvinist roots because that's not where my roots lie. It lies within a Bible-believing movement. It lies with Baptists. Now, Baptists have their doctrines wrong too, but they're the best group. You might say, why Baptists? Because baptism, I don't know if you remember this, it is so important when you read Dr. Upman's church history book, okay, that I taught you, and when I, we went through the tenets of a Bible-believing movement, I think there were nine tenets of that. Yeah. I told you what was extremely important was baptism was so important. Why was water baptism so important? It proved a sign of whether you are a genuine believer or not. Because the Catholic religion, that's why there was war and death over just getting dunked in, a, dunked in water or sprinkled in water. Why make that a big deal? It was a big deal during the early church. Why? It proved the sign, I'm not part of this Catholic system. I'm not a part, of, and then that's what the Calvinist and sadly Luther had a problem with. They followed that Catholic practice. Infant baby sprinkling. That's why Baptist and Anabaptist they were distinguished and considered radicals, and I'll tell you about them later. Why? Because, no, that baptism don't count. Baptism is when I truly am saved by faith in Jesus Christ, then I can get baptized. Give me a proof text. Acts chapter 8. What doth hinder me to be baptized? If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Baptized. All right? It's that simple. So that's why Baptist is the best route to go by that time. Now, uh, so that's why, you know, we may, I told you that Baptist history can go back early centuries. They may not be named Baptist, but that practice was important. That's what distinguished these early believers from the Catholic Church. Baptism was extremely important and salvation. Okay, so now that I said all of that, let's cover Desiderius Erasmus. Through his eyes, we can see Bibles whose roots stem from the apostles and whose branches spread around the globe bearing the fruit of the Reformation Bibles, such as the German Luther, French Olivetan, Italian Diodati, Spanish Reina Valera, and the King James Bible. So that's why Textus Receptus is so important. It was from Erasmus. But <clears throat> how, was, how did this come to pass? In Erasmus of Christendom by Roland H. Bainton, we are told that Erasmus' father became a priest and went to Rome, supporting himself there by copying manuscripts. In Joseph Mangan's Life, Character, and Influence of Erasmus, it is said that his parents sent him for six years to Gerard Groot's School of the Brethren of the Common Life, a group which made their living by the copying of manuscripts. So see, he, so he grew up with copying manuscript background. And I don't get these scholars who criticize Erasmus today, modern Bible translators. Erasmus was more brilliant than all of them put together right now. Mangan also says that because of their location in Holland, this group was not tainted by many of the heresies of the Roman church. Oh, so Erasmus had a good start. When the parents of Erasmus died of the plague in 1483, he was sent to a monastery. Froud goes on to say that Erasmus was heir to a moderate fortune and since his guardians wanted it for themselves, 
they sent him to a convent at Brabant in the Netherlands. According to the new Schaff Herzog Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge, he described his education as an attempt to force him into the life of a monk. Why is that? Frau explains that it was common to kidnap boys and girls of money or rank and send them into religious orders in the 15th century. Erasmus wrote that children whose parents had demanded their release had been buried alive or otherwise murdered. He complained about the immoral behavior and drunkenness of the monks as well. Amen. No, they ain't pious people. They were Judas Iscariots, like Wycliffe pointed them out. Point out to a so-called pious friar begging for money. Wycliffe said, you're a Judas, Judas Iscariot who sold out our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Rightfully so, these wicked, evil people. <clears throat> Frederick Scribner, in a plain introduction to New Testament textual criticism, says that Erasmus was forced to become a priest, become an Augustinian monk, and join a monastery. Although Durant says in his work, The Reformation, Volume 6, and The Story of Civilization, it was only because of the library it held. Uh, he took advantage of the free education and consumed the libraries. So he was a book, he was a nerd. Erasmus tracked on contempt of the world showed his contempt for the life of a monastery and the monks and priests who were more pagan than Christian. That's what he pointed out. He left the monastery at about the age of 20 and sought a position near Brussels, Belgium, with a bishop who had a great library. Erasmus found many manuscripts there and then secured his release to go to the University of Paris to earn a doctorate in theology. He didn't respect the degree, but said only that to fight the monsters he had to fight, he must dress like Hercules. Wow. You know, that sounds like, uh, that's similarly what I'm doing. Why? Why do I go to their university? So that I can meet at their game, yeah. you know, fight these monsters at the education level. Now, this is interesting, uh, uh, what Erasmus said. Both John Calvin and Ignatius Loyola Two other players in the Reformation were schooled there, although neither of them was as disgusted as Erasmus by the teaching he encountered. So this is so interesting, all right? He finally left the University of Paris, claiming that heresy did not arise among the laity, but from the teachers. Sounds like a Ruckman who attended a Christian school, but got disgusted and fought back tooth and nail and wrote a ton of books against them. And you call those people spiteful, hateful? Not, what about your great Erasmus? No, we're just following a Bible-believing tendency. What? Schol scholarship is based off a of secular humanism, paganism that, dis that deserves kicking in the rear end. All right, let's keep reading here. He called the theologians of the time men with rotten brains dull intellects, and brutish manners. He claimed that they were proud. And yeah, see, I told you so. What Human nature ne never changed. You see these so-called intellectuals today, right? Acting like they're holier than thou, especially if they're from a Christian university. Yeah. Makes me sick. He claimed, listen up, this is so interesting. You Calvinists need to listen to this too if you came from seminary, those theological schools. All right, this is great Erasmus. He claimed that they were proud and surrounded themselves with bodyguards of definitions. Can I get an amen on that one? That's, that is good stuff, amen. That is today's scholars. They hide their stupidity when they are so stupid and when they're caught in a corner with bodyguard of definitions. Basically semantics and terms that you poor people would not understand and catch. You know what that is? That's dishonest. That's dishonesty. And I hate that. That's why I kick them and expose them for what they are on that one. He moved on to Italy searching for manuscripts. Pope Nicholas V, who had died in 1455, has sent scholars to scour Europe and Asia, Asia Minor, for copies of Greek and Latin manuscripts and had added 5,000 Greek ones to his collection in the eight years of his effort. 
Erasmus devoured these. That's 5,000. That's a lot. He made friends with Vatican librarians and was given access to everything they had. Some of these libraries were destroyed by the French in war after he had gotten everything he could from them. He also befriended scholars who shared his anti-papal leanings. Bainton notes that Erasmus asks in one of his writings, quote, is Pope Julius the successor of Jesus Christ or Julius Caesar? He then spent the rest of his life in England and Protestant Northern Europe. He noted the serious errors in the Latin Vulgate Bible of Jerome and began to compile a Greek New Testament of his own. Yeah, that's a good guy right there. Remember, Jerome's Latin Vulgate was that Alexandrian manuscript line where the Roman church uh, received its uh, teachings. One important note to make is whenever someone says that, uh, excuse me, let me skip this part. Erasmus, in spite of his contempt for the Catholic hierarchy, was offered a cardinal's hat. Kind of like, remember Savonarola? And then he said, no, I'll take a red hat of blood instead. So Erasmus was not that blunt. He had to be clever, right? It's like what Tom Cho said, right? Befriend them, and then you just go underground agent and just stab them like that. That was Erasmus. He was offered a cardinal's hat, but refused it, and probably could have been pope if he had wanted He was the most highly respected authority on Greek manuscripts and the most highly respected scholar in general of his day. Today, there are over 5,200 manuscripts of the Greek New Testament, many of which were not available in Erasmus' time, and yet over 99% agree with his Greek New Testament. This guy was brilliant, there's no doubt. No matter what today's Alexandrian modern scholars with their high technology and whatever manuscript they can dig up, guess what? You're not going to beat that percentage from the King James Bible. That's huge. God's word stands. Less than 1% disagree. In his life from 1466 to 1536, he produced several editions of his work rejecting manuscript readings from the Vatican's Codex Vaticanus, discovered in a Vatican library in the late 1400s, and upholding readings from the traditional text used by the Greek churches for centuries. Writing in 1815, Frederick Nolan, in his work, An Inquiry Inquiry into the Integrity of the Received Text, says that Erasmus attributed the corruption of manuscripts Oh, so who did Erasmus blame the corruption of manuscripts? To origin. That guy was smart. He was on target. You you thought that he was a Ruckmanite. No, I think that Ruckman saw something similar that other Bible believers saw. If you're a Bible believer and you share that same Holy Spirit with the respect for his word, you're going to come down to the same conclusions. And you're going to find that corruption. Origin, remember, he was the origin of all that, that manuscript corruption that I taught you before. He goes on to say, it is, quote, it is indisputable that he was, Erasmus, was acquainted with every variety which is known to us. Also, quote, Erasmus published an edition which corresponds with the text which has been since discovered to prevail in the great body of Greek manuscripts. So that was the life of Desiderius Erasmus. All right, so because of Erasmus, there was a famous saying that you want to uh, hear about. It has been uh, Dr. Upman's History of the New Testament Church, the History of the New Testament Church, Volume 1, page 534. Dr. Upman writes, it has, been, it has rightly been said that Erasmus laid the egg. Erasmus laid the egg that Luther hatched. So then, what came out as a result? This is from Erasmus. And then the guy who made it blow up, he changed history that secular historians, they have to mention his name. Martin Luther. Came about. Erasmus laid the groundwork. Luther just exploded it to pieces. Luther was also a scholar, but the difference with Erasmus and him, Erasmus was smooth. Luther was crude and blunt. 
Me, I'm kind of in between, all right? I'm kind of in between with Erasmus and Luther. So that's how I am. I like how God uses different people in different ways, amen? amen. If you want me to fit in your kind of mannerisms and your personality, the way that I teach and preach, uh, then you're going to take away what God has given to me. I refuse to do that. I ain't going to go smooth like John MacArthur. That ain't me. I'm going to preach and teach the way God wanted me to preach and teach. Amen. All right, let's look at uh, page 467. All right. Uh, Dr. Upman's Church History book. All right, now this is going to be... <laughs> You're going to enjoy this one, all right, about Luther. The background of Luther is well known. He had a humble, rustic origin and worked his way through school at Eisenach, Germany by singing on the street. So he was a singer. The material of Martin Luther is, is so voluminous that it approaches the work done by secular writers of the person and teachings of Christ. Pope Leo X called him drunken German. Peter Mosellanus said he was polite, clever, fresh, cheerful, at ease. Jerome Alexander called Luther fool, dog, and ribald, and Catton. The papist emissary described him as deep-eyed German beast. So he was, that's how famous he was. Both good and bad he was called. Luther was outlawed by the church and state condemned by the Pope, the Emperor, and the universities, and was cast out of human society to be left exposed to a violent death. Schaff says that his famous thesis was strongly assailed by all the champions of scholastic theology and traditional orthodoxy, that is, by all intelligent, educated, religious Roman Catholics. The Appalachian popular preacher was his as well. Heinrich Hein, a German-Jewish writer, so this is a Jew, says of Luther, he was a dreamy mystic and a practical man of action, a cold stickler for words and an inspired, divinely intoxicated prophet, full of the most awful fear of God, full of consecration to the Holy Spirit, a complete man, I might say, an absolute man. So that's, that tells a lot from a Jew, actually, wow. giving that much credit to Luther. In answer to anyone who might be seeking for the cause of the upheaval that followed in his tracks, Luther said, quote, I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. The word did it all. That sounds like a Bible believer. Do not think, he said at another time, do not think that the gospel can be advanced without tumult, trouble, and uproar. Amen. He also says, Thus thou hear this, O Pope, not the most holy, but the most sinful. Would that God would hurl thy chair headlong from heaven and cast it down into the abyss of hell. Who gave you the power to exalt yourself above God? Amen. O Lord Christ, look down upon this. Let the day of judgment come and destroy the devil's liar at Rome. If this is not Antichrist, I do not know what it is. Oh, yeah, amen, amen. Some of you are just, uh, oh, oh, like, you know, I, you're not used to hearing that in churches. Always is lovey-dovey style, you know. You, I don't know if you read your Bible. The Bible has harsher words than that concerning about judgment. You've been uh, deep, you've been programmed by this world to be soft to not take a stand, to not see the wickedness and the evil that's going on. So Luther, I mean, he was what you can say a rude, crude speaker in his speech. But that, that's no surprise. Paul was the same thing. He said that his speech was rude, speech contemptible. So, so that means rough, crude. There is no doubt as to Luther's views on Antichrist, the famous eschatological subject of pre-Reformation times. Luther was even pre-millennial in his exposition of the second chapter of Daniel. Practically speaking, to be honest though, he was amillennial, but at least he got that part down. And remember, remember during that time, we got to be more gracious to these people who didn't have such access and wealth to doctrine like we did. 
believing in a general resurrection and final judgment at the second advent. As a practical theologian, Luther excelled all men of his day. He had full command over the vocabulary of his times. He used common sense, irony, uh, abuse, resorting at times to coarse and vulgar expressions, which even at that age offended men of culture and taste, and set, quote, a bad example for his admirers. <laughs> you know, people say that about me online too, but guess what? You know, uh, that's something that some of the apostles did, if you read your Bible, and that's something that God used during these men during that time. And you know, to be quite honest, usually a person who's very cultured to your taste don't gain that much attention compared to a person who bluntly speaks it out as it is and gets rough. They get way more attention. Think about that and pray about that for a while. Luther developed his theology before the eyes of the public. Schaff says he had a genial heart, but a violent temper. He could express the deepest thought in the clearest and strongest language, and he had abundant resources of juicy and forcible epithets, which he used constantly. He used the proof text method to a large extent in preaching. And his translation of the scripture is a landmark in the history of theology, education, and language alike. Luther naturally approached the matter of translation from the grammatical, historical standpoint instead of the allegorical. That is, he adhered to the principles of the Antiochian school of Syria instead of the principles of the Alexandrian school in Egypt. Luther said, Scripture itself is its own best interpreter. Amen. End of quote. He felt that Scripture alone should reign. Hence, sola scriptura. That became that famous phrase that you'll hear. He spoke of the Bible as, quote, the Holy Spirit's own peculiar book, with God in, quote, every syllable. Let's see right here. The next page, page 470. So Luther, he was responsible for being very literal as well. Now before these Calvinists get on to me, you know, about the way that I preach, teach, and talk, you know, why don't they look at their hero, huh? They don't really look at their hero that well, do they? They say Luther was Calvinist, so then, well, if you make a boast about Reformation Day and Luther and all that, then why don't you look at this guy right here? Sometimes these people, uh, they don't study their history. You know what they go by? They go by their own feelings of what Christianity is. They don't study out there. They don't study. Luther's German Receptus on page 470 is the first complete Bible translation for, from the original languages into a modern vernacular language of Europe. Low German translations were made of it. A Dutch New Testament from Luther's was published in 1523. The Danish New Testament of 1524 was based on Luther's work. The Swedish New Testament by Olaus Petri came from Luther, as Olaus had attended Luther's lectures at Wittenberg. The Icelandic New Testament, 1540, borrowed much from Luther. A Hebrew New Testament for missionary work among the Jews. And a Bible in Slovenian, uh, which is now in Yugoslavia, came from Luther's Receptus, plus a Croatian New Testament. 1562, and the Hungarian New Testament, 1541. That's Luther's fruits of his Bible. Providence used Luther's violent temper as an instrument to complete the battering process against the papal system begun many years earlier. He graciously addressed Pope Paul III as your hellishness and again as most hellish father. It was a play against, you know, your holiness or your holy father. <laughs> if the Bible was tough on Rome, Luther was in agreement with it. Quote, the court of Rome is more corrupt, is more corrupt than Babylon or Sodom, the most lawless den of thieves, the most shameless of all brothels, the very kingdom of sin, death, and hell. So that not even Antichrist, if he were to come, could devise any addition to its wickedness. Amen. 
let's close it off right here. <laughs> so what a fun guy. I'll give uh, more of his quotes later on. Very, very good quotes. Luther is definitely a guy you want to study more. All right, we'll continue on Luther and then see how he made a comeback against this Catholic system, all right? Uh, there's a movie that I recommend. Uh, it's a black and white film. Not the color one, the black and white. Color's okay too, but black and white, white is much better. It's uh, Martin Luther, black and white. Very old film, but it's, it w it was one, it's one of my favorite Christian films. It gives a great story of Martin Luther. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that tonight's discipleship informed us more about the growth of your word and truth and to have an appreciation for men of God throughout history who stood for truth. And I pray that we'll be able to follow in their footsteps uh, the right things, obviously, not the wrong things they did, but the right things, so that we can glorify you even further. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.